Hi, this is Peter Propp. I run the Marketing Leadership Practice at Shore Communications. And welcome back to 10 Minute Strategy. This is part two of my interview with Ted Rubin. He's a social media strategist and brand evangelist. He sits on a lot of boards, he tweets a lot, he's got a ton of Twitter followers. Let's talk, Ted, about tools because, uh, as we discussed earlier, you're, you're a big TweetDeck fan. I've used TweetDeck, I like it most of the time. Um, tell me how you feel about TweetDeck. Well, I, I'm addicted to TweetDeck. I love TweetDeck. Now, I'm not necessarily the best example because I'm the kind of guy that loves things and likes to stick with them. I'm not, I'm not a big early adopter, um, mainly because, again, I find something I like, whether it's a restaurant, a car. You know, I, I, I like to stay with things that are working. But right. what I love about TweetDeck is just the view of – I manage a lot of Twitter accounts. Right. So it makes it very, very easy for me in one quick snapshot – to view a lot of what's going on, to view my mentions, to view my, my, my DMs, to watch hashtags, to watch other accounts that I'm, that I'm involved with, and to tweet out, excuse me, from multiple accounts all at once. So like if there are different accounts I'm managing and, and, and the same tweet is appropriate, I can send it out from many different venues. So I love TweetDeck. My problems with TweetDeck is that it's a, apparently, and I am totally not a technologist, so totally clueless to me, but I'm told that the Adobe Air that it's built on is an issue for them. And it stalls on me a lot now. It, it's the, the circle starts going and I can't do things and that gets me crazy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, what about, what about uh, from a mobile device? You use TweetDeck on the mobile also? No, I don't because, okay, don't don't look at me like cross-eyed, but I am a BlackBerry guy. I know uh -huh. that we're few and far between these days. I actually just got an iPad 2 um, as a gift, so I'm going to have to, and I'm, I'm clueless, you know, because I'm such not a Mac guy. And people say to me, look, it's just like your iPhone. Just do this. And I'm like, I don't have an iPhone. Um, I use Uber Twitter. Um, which I believe they might have renamed it um, into Uber. Oh, it's Uber Social now. Twitter had an, a, an issue with them using the name Uber Twitter, and they shut them down. They stopped letting them use their API for about a week mm -hmm. until they changed their name and, yeah, and some of their branding. I love. I, I'm I'm very fond of Uber Social from my from my BlackBerry. It works great, but again, it's 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 a handheld. You can't do as much from it. You have to switch back and forth between accounts. So from my BlackBerry, I mostly tweet just from my own personal account. Interesting, interesting. Okay, so let's let's talk a little bit about um, your experience. You 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 are running social and and marketing overall. Is that right for for a cosmetics firm? Yes, I was the chief marketing officer of Elf Cosmetics, EyesLipsFace dot com, from two thousand eight through two thousand ten. Okay, through the beginning of two thousand ten. And and in that process, you that that became a real success story in the Twitter world. Well, it became a risk success story in the Twitter world and in the social space to begin with. Um, you know, I was there in, er, in 2008 when, when social was really first starting to scale, or I should say the platforms. Right. Um, Facebook and Twitter were really first starting to scale. YouTube, which has been around for a lot longer, and people tend to you know, forget about it. They talk about social. When they talk about the social platforms, they tend to talk about um, Twitter and Facebook. But, you know... YouTube is probably one of the most powerful mediums. Absolutely. It's just it's a lot it's a lot harder to wrap your hands around and get value out of. So it works for some brands, it doesn't work for others, and, and that has to do with mostly, I believe, in the product offerings and the things you're doing and your price points uh, and the market you're going after. And for Elf, it was a it was a huge benefit because people loved our product. Our product sold at one, three, and five dollars. We were known as the the, the makeup brand that sold for a dollar a piece originally that's all there were with dollar products and women just adore our products so you know what, what I discovered in 2008 when I really put the stops on all the limited activities they were doing and and just to back up a second to understand Elf is a company that has never had a traditional marketing budget zero I mean no money to spend we don't buy ads we don't buy anything everything is earned media and and then social and word of mouth and when I joined them you know they they kind of you know um hit a plateau. They were doing around 15 million in sales. Um, they were using up, you know, doing a lot in the, in the, in the word of mouth world, but we realized a great opportunity there to take advantage of social. And I also discovered that there were YouTube videos being made all the time about Elf. Women love the product. It's aspirational. It's makeup. You know, we were talking about women in our last segment. Right. And the beauty, what's great about women in makeup is they become little girls. I don't care if they're 20 or they're 70, I don't care if they're wealthy or not, you send a woman a box of free cosmetics, even dollar cosmetics, and invariably the email you get the next day from them was, oh my God, I was up all night playing with my new stuff. 
women play with makeup. So they love to videotape that. They like to see the looks. They like to take photos. So what we started doing is really leveraging user-generated content at ELF. And I built the first site that aggregated user-generated content for a major brand in this country. And we called it Ask Elf. We, we, we had it in a different place than Elf because we wanted to see what, what really happened with it. And then what we did was we saw that I found that on YouTube there were videos being made about Elf. Now, YouTube is the second most used search engine in the, in, in the world, right. but it, it's, it wasn't built as a search engine, so it's incredibly inefficient. So if you search something, you'll find that you search Elf Cosmetics, you'll find a bunch of videos, and you'll think that's all there is. But as you click on each one, it's like a spider web. Right. It, it, right. You find new ones and you find new ones. So when I joined them, they thought there were about 10 videos about them, and there were a few hundred. And what I discovered is when I started letting the, the vast community of women know that if they simply posted a video on YouTube, we would suck it up, spidering the web, into our environment and show it to all the women that visit our site. Th there was not a day that went by while I was there that a new video wasn't produced on YouTube about Elf. And then we took that and we leveraged that into the whole Twitter, you know, Facebook side right, of things. Right. And I, I built a very large Twitter presence for myself. Uh, I love Twitter. It's my platform of choice because basically... I'm a frustrated author. I always have been. I, I have names of books squirreled away in different places. I own URLs. I keep meaning to write them, but I'm also not a writer. I, I'm an idea guy. I, I, I spurt out things. I sit in meetings. I say, somebody better be taking notes because I'm not going to remember later. I'm not going to remember in 10 minutes what I talked about 10 minutes ago. Uh, if you give me a quick note about it, I'll definitely be able to go off and figure out where I was going and what I meant. Right. But the idea is, so what I love about Twitter is I can be reading things or talking to Peter Prop, and the minute I get off of this, this interview, I could say, think of something, and I can tweet it out. And, and also, I save a lot of those things. Uh -huh. So I build content there. Now, I have a blog now, and I do blog, but if you follow me, you'll see that most of my blog posts are at most two to three paragraphs, and I struggle to do that because it's just not the way I'm at. So what I do on Twitter is I, I communicate with people, I build relationships. I thank, there's not a person that I don't respond to. You ask people in the Twitter sphere about Ted Rubin, and what they'll tell you, my personal brand is, without me having this up on my site, is responsiveness. Mm -hmm. You reach out to Ted, Ted reaches out back to you. Whether it's Twitter, Facebook, anywhere. You communicate with me, I'm going to communicate back. If I don't, it means I missed it, it slipped through the cracks, I was away. Reach out again, because it's my intention to do that. And I got to tell you, the value it's created for me has been exponential and the value it creates for a brand at elf we we built the reputation we built 60,000 followers we built the reputation that when you had a problem when you had a question when you had an idea when you just wanted to talk makeup there was somebody at elf to communicate with you right. and, and that's what we did great so ted uh, let's talk just about your personal brand y you you started out uh, with with elf how many followers did you have at at that point in in 2008 well, I started out with zero. Okay, you started out with zero. And right. by the end of 2009, where, where were you? Um, you know, that's hard to really say because I, I, I don't keep rough, track of those rough, numbers. But I'd numbers. have to say at the end of 2009, I was approaching 20,000. Okay. And um, so what, what was your tactic? Were you just finding people that were interesting? I mean, that's what I do. I just well, find people that I think are interesting and I start following them. And I retweet what they say occasionally and... Stuff like that. Is that? You know, similar to that, what I do is I look for people that have a strong following in a demographic that's important to me. Mm -hmm. So if I want to be speaking to moms, I'm going to follow people that have strong mom followings and I'm going to follow all the people following them. Mm -hmm. If I want to start reaching out to any community, regardless of what it is, the dad's community, the, 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 the social marketing community, I go to Chris Brogan. I follow people that are following Chris. I follow people that are following Jeff Pulver. You know, I look for people that have similar, in, that have similar interests and are following the kind of people that I want them to look to me for that information. Right. But that's just the, that's just the start. In order to make that worthwhile, you can follow as many people as you want. You can build a big following. But if you don't provide value, then those people are not going to pay attention to you. They might still be following you, but they're not going to interact and engage with you and hear what you're saying. So by value, value can be many things. Value can be that you put out original thought, and they think that original thought is important. Value can be that you tweet links of great articles. That Now, what I say to people is never tweet out an article you haven't read yourself.
Right. I don't do that. You know, I, and, and it's one of the things that when people tweet me and say, oh, can you tweet this for me? I have to remind them. I'll do it, but I got to read it first because, you know, I might do a favor for Peter Prop at some point as we build a relationship and I know what your brand is and I see what a smart guy you are. Sure. And, you know, Peter asked me to, you know, Ted, listen, believe me, this is a great article. It's about something important. Can you tweet it for me? I might do that for you because there's a lot of, you know, quid pro quo sure. and, and, sure. and, you know, and pay it forward kind of thing. But it, mostly I will read those articles. So you can pass along articles that are of value. Someone, so a lot of people are known for that. You can communicate. You can engage. You can answer people's questions. Hey, ask me anything you want about social media. Ask me about being a divorced dad. Ask me about being a dad to two teenage daughters. No, please, actually, don't ask me about that. <laughs> I, got, I, I, got, I, got, I got one, so I'm half, half, <laughs> half in the pain you're in. Um, uh, well, this is great, Ted. We've, we've run out of time again. I would love to have you back on the podcast in, in, the, in the future. I think we've only scratched the surface of the stuff that you and I could talk about together. Uh, so will you, will you come back later on? You know, I'd love to do that. Uh, I'm involved with a lot of companies, but some things are changing in my world, for, uh, really uh, on the, in, in a good direction. I might have a few announcements to make, so I'd love to talk to you again in a few weeks. That'd be fantastic. Ted Rubin, thank you so much for being with us in 10-Minute Strategy. Uh, I'm Peter Prop. Thanks a lot. 